OTB Culture Hall of Fame. Brought to you by Now TV. Watch whatever you're in the mood for. Right, it is time for us to uh, welcome another guest to the OTB Culture Hall of Fame. And we couldn't do anybody other than Kenny Cunningham. Last week, Kenny, you would not have been very happy with the conversation we had. Essentially, Owen and uh, a willing accomplice and Stephanie Preisner poured scorn on British comedy, basically saying they were oh. all rubbish. I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. But uh, this is the OTB Culture Hall of Fame, sponsored by Now TV, where you can stream your all-time favorite sitcoms, including The Office, Faulty Towers, and Only Fools and Horses on Now TV. Kenny, we thought of nobody else more qualified to talk about British comedy than you, because it turns out this is one of your favorite things in the world. Well, you suggest an Owen uh, was very critical of the standard of British comedy per se. Is that correct, Owen? I, I wouldn't say I was overly critical. I think it's, there's an ear. You were, you weren't. <laughs> he gives an opinion, Owen. That's why you're here. I think that uh, 80s, 90s British comedy leaves a lot to be desired, especially if you compare them oh. to their uh, United States counterparts. I do think, however... There has been a generation of British comedy that's been unbelievably enjoyable, like the Mitchell and Webb look. You've got uh, the It Crowd. You've got Peep Show. You've got, Joe you mentioned Little Britain before coming on air. I mean, that's uh, kind of well, like this post This is clearly a generational thing here. Oh, what, what, do you mind me asking your age? Grab your passport. Put your passport 19. up and let me have a look at it. Uh, so, passport. My passport actually is here. You know, well, a good, well, a good, <laughs> I've actually got a good born, born in the United Kingdom passport. Let let's me, not forget. So this is this is no. I shouldn't be showing my passport on there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was too light. Actually, I think you were too light taking it down. Uh, I believe you. So the base. My point is, this is clearly a generational thing because you've mentioned a few of those uh, comedies there. I, I know them, but I don't know them too well. That kind of peep show, one or two others. I actually, wasn't a massive fan of. Um, uh, David Williams, etc. Yeah, the little bit was a massive. Uh, right. But I actually thought you were going to make the opposite argument, Owen, when you started in terms of the eighties, nineties kind of British uh, comedy. I actually thought you were going to make the uh, the opposite argument because I'd have a well, I'd have the opposite point of view. So when Tommy said about kind of comedy, he was talking about uh, uh, comedies, etc. I wasn't thinking necessarily British comedy. My, I just wrote down a couple off the top of my head, wrote down a few comedies. It just all happened to be uh, British. Now, you could throw in Father Ted and some very good Irish stuff over the years. But fundamentally, what I had down there was British comedy. And that was because I was putting down the best of British comedy. That was just the best of comedy that I remember uh, growing up. And that would have been... So I'm thinking maybe mid-80s, Jerry Owen. Are you similar to me? I'm not going to ask you to produce your passport now. You wouldn't be I'm as 40, as 42, Owen. Kenny. I'm 42. 1977. 42. So Owen's clearly south of that, although he won't reveal the, ex the exact number. He's a little bit sensitive, which people are when they get to their kind of mid They get a little bit sensitive for some reason about their age here, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> so You've probably been through that. You've probably been through that. Yeah, we've been through that. We don't, I'm at the, clear at the age. Of, like, it doesn't bother me at all. So I'm, I'm 40, you're 42. Owen, you're, you're south of that. So that's clearly, it's an obvious thing to say, but that's clearly a factor, isn't it? Because you haven't been exposed. Oh, when you say you don't rate these comedies, so we're talking about, if you're asking me for the standout comedies when I was uh, growing up, and I haven't watched these. I haven't watched these. I haven't watched uh, Faulty Towers. Some others still have them. I probably haven't watched these for 10, 15 years, Jer. But I would hang me hat. I would hang me hat. I slide that VHS tape recorder into the video machine. I'm bang. I'm absolutely, totally engrossed. But that's not always the case with, with films and comedies, etc. You can go back and you think, you know what? Bit disappointed in that. Hasn't stood a test of time. Blah blah blah. Whatever. But there's a number of series there. Faulty Towers. Some others do have them for me will stand the test of time. And those ones you've mentioned on the peep show, wherever the hell it is you're, you're talking about, 10, 15 years time, people will be scratching their heads. People aren't even, they won't even be in the conversation. Nobody will be talking about them. I would, can I, can we separate these out here? Can we just separate these out? So Faulty Towers ran from 75 to 79, right? Yeah. Now, I was born in 77, so I didn't see this the first time around, but I definitely remember being, 12 or 13 and the reruns coming on and being completely and utterly compelled by what was happening because i think there's only like there's only about 20 episodes there's like two seasons of 10 episodes yeah. i think yeah you're and right, they're 10, absolutely 12. everything's absolutely sensational there's there's no there's no moments that's not no. really brilliant because you, you can remember the actual individual episodes so you think of some you could name a lot of great sitcoms maybe the ones you've mentioned uh 
Oh, but I could, I could say to you, well, g- give me one particular episode. Give me two standout episodes. You'd be like, oh, oh, oh. You, you struggle. But with um, Faulty Towers, each one of those episodes almost kind of stands alone. I can, I can off the top of my head, and my memory's not great, Owen, I could ramble three, four, five of those individual episodes. The, the German tourists uh, who came, uh, the, anniver- the anniversary, Basil and uh, his wife, Prunelle, Prunelle Scales, wasn't it? Was it Prunelle Scales? Yeah, yeah. Was his wife, yeah, because he rolled it with the waitress, uh, Connie Booth. I think he might have actually married her, um, yeah. John Cleese. Might have actually, they kind of co wrote the whole thing. But I can remember individually the rat when Manuel's kind of thought it was a hamster, <laughs> so turned out to be a rat. Yeah, so three or four or five. These are standout episodes, so individual episodes. Now, Jerry's Ryan, when he says there's only 10 or 12 made, um, which is the great thing, and that's why he's why mm-hmm. certain I think sitcoms have fallen down. They've gone second, third, too fourth, long. fifth. Yeah, uh, too long. And yeah, decent enough, like, but the quality's dropped off. And you get lost a bit, so many episodes. Whereas these, uh, Faulty Towers in particular for me, that was individual episodes, absolute Magic, and I think that is a factor, the limited edition, but I think it's more than that. I think the quality, the acting, the, the script is always key. You know better than me. The script, the kind of interaction between the actors, I just think uh, was perfect. John Cleese, uh, Connie P- Prinella Scale. I think the major wasn't he had a permanent resident there, the old major, and, Mel- and Manuel, of course, was perfect. I mean, he was brilliant, John Cleese. I mean, he dominated the whole thing. I mean, he was... On a load of different levels, I think he's quite extraordinary. I mean, comic time, and he's obviously very bright, even physically to look at, lads. He's, you know, kind of Peter Crouch of his, yeah, you know, but it's just his dimensions. <laughs> his dimensions, like, you, can, you can't help taking your taking your eyes off him. So he kind of grabs every, he kind of grabs every scene, and there's not too many, I don't, don't, don't remember too many of those characters, because I remember reading about Faulty Towers, because they sold the rights, um, worldwide, didn't they? So they generally do, don't they? They sell these things on and make all their money. So they sold it to um, they sold it to Spain, say, say for example. But with Faulty Towers, I thought, how do you how do you replicate Basil? Does Spain really have a Basil Faulty type? It's pretty unique, John Cleese. And even in terms of Manuel, the Spanish waiter, same thing. What they had to do, they had to change the waiter because obviously the Spanish waiter wouldn't have worked <laughs> clearly in Spain. So then they get an Italian, they had to get an Italian waiter in called uh, uh, Paolo <laughs> into the show. So I was thinking Italian waiter called Paolo and a different actor playing John Cleese. I couldn't actually see. It. I couldn't. I said, how does that possibly work? Because John Cleese was that good, and he was. Because I'm not a massive fan of um, that. Um, what was that little club he was in, John Cleese? Not the life of Brian and all them lads. Not that little crew. Michael Monty Palin. Python. Mon- yeah, Monty Monty- Python. Yeah, the Monty Python crew, but not a lot of the stage stuff they'd done, the live, the live routines and stuff. It was a bit wacky, wasn't it? Probably right up your street, Jerry, to be honest with you. We, I, I'm, I'm guessing that might have been your thing, was it? I, I'm very I'm... left field. So no. some of some Monty Python is really good, right? And some Monty Python I think is like, what? What? I can't. I can't get it. Uh, I just that's interesting. Yeah. So I'm very I don't think it's all. I don't, I don't yeah. think it's all amazing. And yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm the same. A lot of that stuff is over my head. I actually don't find it uh, uh, very funny. But in this, John Cleese in this particular uh, uh, series, I think is just absolutely spot on. I think it's. I think it's brilliant. I think on a load of different levels, it's. Uh, it's brilliant. I don't think it's a generational thing, Kenny. I think uh, Life of Brian is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, by the same token, I think Airplane is unbelievable. Two of the best comedy films ever made. One was made in 1979, the other was made in 1980. So I appreciate the era, Kenny. So what about, talk about Faulty Towers in particular. Have you, have you, cause you, have you seen most of those episodes on? You probably haven't seen them, so you're not talking from a position. Uh, no. In fact, I could probably argue you're actually bluffing it a little bit if you actually haven't, <laughs> if you actually haven't watched the episodes. I, so like I, me if I'm wrong. Uh, no, I, in fairness, I don't think anybody uh, has managed to avoid Faulty Towers during their life. Kenny. Uh, on some oh, days, right. uh, some days in RTE, when you were playing your football in the United <laughs> Kingdom, uh, Kenny, if you, if you were sitting back home and didn't dig, make dig. it, dig, yeah, dig. exactly, if, if you were... Uh, <laughs> That was, not optional. that was not optional to be very, cut me a bit of slack there. <laughs> you would so have seen. You, so give me, a, give me a spin on it in terms of what was a good, bad, what, did, what worked, what didn't work. 
I don't like slapstick, simple as that. And I thought that there was uh, a fair degree of slapstick that I associate with British comedy of that era. Like, I can appreciate why somebody would find it funny, no question about it. And I'm not judging people here. Uh, but I think it kind of comes with the same territory that, say, keeping up appearances would bring, that there is a sort of, uh, that the hilarity that ensues is often brought on a different level to how you might actually witness it and say the life of Brian, which is very intelligent and very, very witty. And in fairness, Kenny, like I didn't, I didn't say, sit here last week saying Faulty Towers is crap. It was more of a generalization about British yeah. comedy. And I didn't really, I didn't really uh, nitpick Faulty Towers. It got mentioned, it got thrown in. These things happen. Well, you can't uh, generalize that one. That's the, that's the other thing that you've well, that's a good to, point. But, yeah, you can't generalize. You have to examine each specific one. So you say like slaps things. So I understand where you're coming from there. Uh, so some others do have them probably similar to that. Michael Crawford in that. So I'm talking about John Cleese in uh, Faulty Towers. But Michael Crawford, I mean, this is Michael Crawford, went on to be a massive West End star, fan to the opera, you know, world renowned, etc. But talk about kind of humble beginnings. I mean, but his performance and some other do have them. just like amazing for me. Even kind of on a physical level he used to do all his own stunts and uh, uh, that type of thing and just like uh, delivery just how he carried himself I thought that was I thought similar to John Cleese I thought uh, Crawford and those and the some others they were having again were amazing I, d I haven't seen enough I'm surprised that you mentioned some others do have them because I wouldn't have said from just memory again yeah. I wouldn't have watched some others do have them since, um, since the 80s uh, when it was on repeats I'm looking at it here. It went from 73 to 75. And again, there was only 20-odd episodes in uh, this one, which I was kind of surprised by. In my head, it yeah. ran for years because it was always on TV. Yeah. But um, 23 episodes, yeah, uh, including three Christmas specials. Was it that good? Because I, like, I wouldn't have said no, it was a, the same standard as Faulty Towers. No, no, in terms of the other character, I didn't think the other characters, it was his wife, Betty, uh, Betty was in there. I can't remember anything apart from her, and she wouldn't have been the strongest of characters, don't get me wrong. Where it's kind of faulty tears, you've got Prunella Scales, like very good, Connie Man Manuel, not so much the major, uh, to be fair, but they kind of interacted uh, very well, uh, kind of quite kind of codependent on each other. Where there's kind of, some of what happened for me was just basically him just performing, uh, Michael Crawford, I just thought he was brilliant. But you're right, kind of club them two together, but but if Owen's talking about trying to get away from kind of slapstick and kind of move it on a bit. So I remember um, 80s, kind of mid to late 80s, Jay, you would remember this uh, Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister. Can you remember that? I, like I have a vague recollection of it, but there are clips doing the rounds at the minute that are fairly sensational. Of, yeah. um, like the, this, is the, this is the high watermark, I would say. This, is, this feeds into the thick of it, which feeds into Veep, which feeds into... Like it's Armando Iannucci, he's kind of, um, he, he kind of comes from, not that gene pool, but certainly you can see how an intelligent comedy designed to explain how screwed up the world is, yeah, uh, actually has a role on mainstream TV. And I thought that was like, from, from what I can see, that seems to be the clever part of that. Yeah, it was, because that was the, you're right, that was the first comedy, maybe not at the time, how, how old would have been, I would have been mid-teens at the time, so that was the first kind of window in for me in terms of like the whole kind of political machine, really how things operated below the surface, because obviously you had the main actor uh, there, it was Jim Hacker was his name in the actual, I can't remember the, the actor's name, so Humphrey was his kind of, I think his permanent secretary, but he was kind of the top civil Nigel servant. Hawthorne. Nigel he, Hawthorne, like yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely yeah. brilliant in terms of how he played uh, the role. But that was amazing just to see. It was comedy, but at the same time, it gave you information in terms of this is how government works. You've got your figurehead cabinet minister, but what's really happening below that in terms of the civil service, the games that they're uh, playing, people getting pushed in certain directions, compromises being uh, made here and there, but obviously on a you know comedy level. But that was kind of very intelligent. And I... When I've watched series after that, say the last 10, 15 years, say kind of The West Wing, which I got into, I loved that uh, the series The West Wing. So that was a natural evolution for me from from Yes Minister, Yes Prime Minister. So that was, I, I found that, or that I was re really engaged in that. You could mention maybe House of Cards, that's maybe diff bit, obviously a bit darker. But Yes uh, Minister, Yes Prime Minister, it's the first one for me that really kind of, yeah, you're right, Jer, really clever, actually giving you, giving you information. But I like the way they delivered it. Did you watch The Thick of It and, um, and Veep? Have you seen any of those, either of those? Uh, sorry, what was the first one, Jer? I missed it. The, the Thick of It? No. I think, you'd, I think you'd like it. 
I think, uh, yeah, I think it's definitely something that you could get into if, uh, if the behind the scenes and politics with uh, an added layer of swearing, an updated version of um, Sir Humphrey is kind of, um, if you cross Sir Humphrey with um, Alistair Campbell and, uh, <laughs> and a, a filthy mouth, that's what you get. But the script writers, that his character in particular, the kind of script that he had, how he spoke, uh, the language he used, I mean, how he put words together, I mean, so evasive and like saying everything but saying nothing at the same time, you know, it was brilliant really in terms of the, obviously he was dependent on the script which was given to him, I don't know who the, uh, the writer was, but um, yeah, that was really, that wouldn't get too many mentions, uh, I don't know why I thought of it, but I only scribbled, I didn't go looking for stuff yesterday, Tommy... Uh, the great Wizard of Oz there in the background kind of mentioned it to me about the uh, the comedies and I, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm just going to scribble. Anything comes into my head, I'll put down because I'm not going to go onto the internet and start digging out British comedy. I, I'd rather just whatever comes to my head, I'll, I'll put it down. It's a natural way to do it. So even just last night, little bits, I've mentioned a couple there already, but I'd put another one, even kind of, um, so Owen's mentioned about Slapstick. Owen, have you ever seen Steptoe and Son? No, but I'm familiar with it. Never seen an episode of my entire life. Yeah, have a look at it. Let, let me know what you think of it. Because that's, I think too, that, that's great. I think that's great as well. The kind of dynamic between them two, father and son, and pretty much the camera on their faces inside the house, pretty much all during the, uh, uh, the episodes. But just like the acting and that and the dialogue and that, I think, it's, I think that's brilliant absolutely fantastic that's another one for me which again probably wouldn't get a mention it kind of uh, stu- uh, came into my head last night and I put it down I'd, I'd put that one up there there's the obvious ones isn't there um, kind of Only Fields and Horses is, uh, is an obvious one Phoenix Knights is one as well which really caught me by surprise uh, Peter Kay and again that's another one that gets a little bit of a eh from people when I mention it that, you know people like ah take it or leave it but I thought that was exceptional uh, the, the script in that, just in terms of, I don't. You probably know better than me. It was more of a situation thing. Clearly, he'd been Peter K. Been brought up surrounded by this type of environment, working class environment, social club, uh, cabaret, real community feel. That that type of thing. Seventies, uh, eighties. Uh, I don't think. I don't think that could, it was replicated so much. Maybe in in Ireland, but I recognise say I recognise the pub. Uh, dynamic uh, when I was growing up. So when I was growing up, say my mum and dad down the pub, we'd be going down the pub occasionally. You'd go into the pub, you'd know where everybody was sitting before you wake. And before you open the door of the pub, you'd know, well, they're going to be there. Such and such, the neighbours will be over there. The, those friends, will, everybody had their own little groups. That, but that was the pub environment. And as I remember in Dublin, that probably would have been re- replicated all over Ireland. And this, and I recognised that from watching Phoenix Nights. Although there was a cabaret, there was a stage there, and there was a, a little, there was a little bit of that going on around it. I reckon that, that that kind of togetherness, that kind of ordinary people, and just the funny side how people, how ordinary people live, just kind of funny situations. Nothing slapstick like you were mentioned there. Or nothing extroverted kind of going on, but just kind of very down to air, normal day to day situations, which you've all experienced. So I think Peter Kay kind of encapsulated that. He got that very quickly and he, he put that Phoenix Nights down. And I think that's brilliant, Phoenix Nights. What, what informed. And, uh, sorry, go on, Jer. Have you watched Phoenix Nights, Owen? No, no. So I think Phoenix Nights, again, only two series, right? Yeah. And it's 2001, 2002. That's mad. I'd never never come across it uh, at all, Kenny. That's uh, a completely new one from... From my perspective, yeah. Well, that was his um, that was his breakthrough, wasn't it, Jared Peter K. Uh, the Phoenix Knights. I'm trying to think of anything he'd done, but obviously, he's done very well. He actually done a very clever he's, little thing. Go ahead, Jer. It's funny that they don't go into like seven, eight, nine series the way no. mm. like things do now, yeah. And he's I've heard him speak, Peter K. And that was a, a deliberate thing. He was happy, I think he was very conscious of the fact maybe what we were talking about earlier. If you get something right and you get it to a certain level you know, best, it's the hardest thing to do, but just draw a line under it and move on and say, right, I can't really better that. Let's just leave it there. Could easily make another series, make a bit of money and drag it out. But yeah, I heard Peter Kay mention that and I said, yeah, I had a bit of respect. I said, yeah, fair play. And that's probably helped it. But again, like I said to Owen, it's it's the content really, which 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 is why it stands up. And he had a spin-off off that Max and Paddy Jared, to like the two bouncers. Because he played he played two roles. Oh, and he played two roles and he played a... Uh, 
he was played he loads was, of roles. He played loads of roles. Yeah, he played, yeah. He, played, yeah, he was confined to the wheelchair. Brian Potter, uh, great car, and then obviously Max and Paddy were great because yeah, they had that spin-off series, Max and Paddy on the road, wasn't it? Off the back of that, and that was fantastic. I mean, that that was really. I mean, obviously, that, I thought that was amazing. That kind of spin-off series. Ah, oh, forget it. Like you know, flogging a dead horse here, but that was like brilliant. I thought that was, <laughs> Max and Paddy for me was amazing. So them too, but Phoenix Knights in particular, I thought was great. Absolutely great. Uh, what uh, what, so, in, what informs you uh, in terms of all of these shows, Kenny? Because it's like you go back to Steptoe and Son, and that is early 60s. Like this is a, a long way back. What, what is informing your view that this sort of comedy is what you liked? Yeah, I, I, I can't say I'm, I'm particularly obsessed. It's not an obsession I have a mm. comedy per se, and certainly British comedy. I'll, I'll watch anything. Um, I, I think when I went to the UK originally for a, for a period of time, for year, um, years I'm talking here, I would have watched a huge amount of uh, film and uh, TV, books to a, uh, books as well, actually, to be honest with you. But yeah, I mean, just video, cinema, I absolutely loved it. So I, I, I would have watched a huge volume of stuff uh, at that particular time. Now, I would have kind of up and down a little bit uh, over the years. I'd say maybe the last few years, probably not so much. That's probably bounced back a little bit. Young film, Young film now has got a little bit more interest in film the last couple of years. So we've we're kind of cracked on again. So it's kind of peaked and troughed a little bit. But fundamentally, I've always loved, loved uh, uh, fil- film and TV, film in particular. But my TV is that, that period of when I'd say when I, uh, four or five years before I left Ireland and then for a few years after I came over uh, to the UK. So all of those kind of series, the ones that were made around that time, I would have uh, I would have jumped on board. But there's, I mean, there's loads of other stuff. Say, even going back again, I, I, I must have watched the, I mean, Step to and so on, you're right, that would have been getting, that wouldn't be getting churned out on BBC in the, in the kind of, early 90s I wouldn't imagine they might have done occasionally maybe it's the kind of advent of Sky on U- UK Go maybe things like that I stumbled across it again but kind of um, so Rise and Damp is another one I'd, I'd put up there so in t- so say John Cleese uh, Michael Crawford and Leonard Rossiter in, in Rise and Damp again I don't know if you've seen it Jerry you no. have seen it I've seen some of it yeah I know Leonard Rossiter more from the, the other one that he did where he walks into the sea what's that one? Uh, I look it up. You keep you talk amongst yeah. yourselves there. But it's like so rise and damp. So this this is set in uh, is the sixties uh, in the uh, in the UK. It might have actually been made. It might be made sixties, seventies. Uh, uh, but again, he's a landlord of a of a big uh, build, and he rents out. He sublets it to different people. Um, he's got two people who rent off, but he's the character. He really enjoys a very kind of hyperactive uh, character, uh, constantly on edge. He's got a bit of a, he fancies the, the, uh, the one Mrs. Jones, <laughs> the famous Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Jones. He's got a bit of a thing for her, and he's, he's never offside. He's, he's, a, he's very much of a gentleman, but he's got this bit of a thing, unrequited love, and she kind of fl- flirts a little bit. She's a little bit uh, shy as well. So this is a kind of the underlying thing, which kind of drives it a little bit. But his character, again, it's brilliant. The acting's brilliant. I mean, he was great in the theatre, by all accounts. And uh, Leonard Rossiter just read a bit about him. He had a very successful uh, stage uh, career. And I think you can see a bit of that with, with some of these people. Like, they're actually like st- stage actors. It's actually a craft. Uh, I'd say Michael Crawford and Leonard Rossiter is another one. Just brilliant uh, acting now. Because there's not an awful lot going on. Because when they walk into a room, there's not much there in terms of props. And, you know, a lot of the maybe sitcoms today, comedy... You know, it's it's about more than like the individual character, what they have to say. There's a lot, a lot of stuff going on in the background or whatever. But these things, it was just the person themselves driving it. It was, you were literally just focused on them and they had to grab your attention. They had to keep you involved. So Leonard Russell was another one rising down, but that only came to me there this morning. It was me boiled eggs. Uh, <laughs> and I was thinking, have I got enough scribble on the back of this envelope? And for some reason, uh, Leonard Russell uh, came into my head and I thought, you know what? Uh, that is amazing. Brilliant as well. So I, I looked it up there. Rising Damp was 74 to 80. And he also simultaneously was in a sitcom called The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perry. Ah, that's right. I didn't watch Reginald Perry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, so he played Rigsby in Rising Damp. That's like, again, yeah. these are kind of TV characters who certainly survived the test of time. You know, it's, um, I, I'd say, I don't, I'd like to see what Rising Damp looks like. A, a lot of these um, sitcoms kind of become. Uh, Unrebroadcastable, but I, I think they probably are still rebroadcastable. The Fall and Rise of Reggie Perrin was on late night television when we were kind of late teens, so 
um, mid nineties. They showed it again on a program called The End in uh, in Ireland. So that's when I would have been introduced to that. So that's like fifteen years after it first comes out. Yeah. I don't know if they just got them because they were cheap. There's a good chance that we saw all this TV because the BBC were like, "Give me the change down the back of the couch in RTE, <laughs> and you can have these, and you can broadcast them as often as you like." Uh, yeah, because. But- but I think you make a good point there, Jay. Um, you, you've alluded to something there in terms, I don't know, it was something in terms of material where they haven't shown these things back. And I think you're, I think you're right. So I think Rise and Dam may well be a, an example of that. And off the top of my head, I'm thinking as well, do you remember the, the character Alf Garner in Sickness and in Health? Now, that was a, he was a great, a very good character to me. That was a good series. I wouldn't put that up there in Sickness and in Health. But you don't see a lot of those repeats. So there's obviously an issue in, in terms of now what's acceptable, what's perceived to be acceptable in terms of broadcast or not. Because um, Royce and Damp, I mentioned the two people who are kind of uh, who are renting uh, rooms in the... Uh, in his house, one was obviously Mrs. Jones, and it was a student, but he was a black student, but kind of very articulate, uh, very uh, well spoken. And uh, uh, Leonard Rossiter's character, uh, uh, Rigsby, in, t- in terms of his language uh, t- in, t- in today's environment, would be perceived to be, or oh, that's a, maybe un- unacceptable. So I think you're right, if that's what you were trying to say, Jerry, in terms of maybe some of the material there, some people would stay away from think, well, we don't really want to go near. That. We don't really want to put that out, maybe for genuine reasons, but I, it does frustrate me a little because I think there's a whole tranche of like TV film. For me, it's absolutely uh, brilliant, and and young people nowadays, and they say young people, even their twenties, stories aren't going to get exposed with uh, for those reasons. But you have to remember, I mean, these things, films, drama, whatever it is, Jared, it's it's of its time, isn't it? It's 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 of its time. It's a reflection of uh, how, uh, how people lived, uh, uh, the attitudes of the times, percep- perceptions. I think that's the way you have to uh, look at those things. You can't say, well, there was a word used, there was a turn of phrase there. Well, that's that's totally unacceptable. That's never going to see the light the light, the light of day again. You know, on the on terrestrial television, I think that'd be an absolute shame. I'd like to think people are educated enough now. You know, people are well rounded enough to know. Well, this was of its time. Certain certain parts are absolutely fantastic, very funny, stand the test of time. Other parts, no, I don't like that. And there would be certain pieces of it today. I, I'd be a little bit uncomfortable. But yeah, I'm, not, I'm sure you could edit. That. You can, I'm sure you could re-edit them. That's like if if the stuff is good enough, there's probably a case for re-editing it and letting the art speak for itself. I, I the only the caveat I would have is that, um, uh, hoping that people are well-rounded enough. I'm just not sure that the evidence is always there that we have a, a lot of well-rounded people when it comes to this kind of stuff. Can I ask you though? So what would the, the point of this show is to get um our guests in this case oh. you to 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 put something into the uh, OTB Culture oh, Hall right. of Fame. So this uh, is the reverse of room one one on one. Is this is reverse? Mm. We're not exactly. Stuff. It, yeah. It, exactly. Exactly. So you've you've come with a you know you've got a big arsenal here. There's like a, I mean, a, I've got a loads. million different I, things you can choose. Yeah, I've got. Lo- I'm gonna I'm gonna throw and just let me throw a few names at you. Porridge. Yeah. Right, Ronnie Barker. Brilliant. Absolutely outstanding. Oh, and I'm just gonna bounce these off. Yeah, I was not coming back. So I've please. seen Porridge. I've seen Porridge. Yeah, don't worry. What do you think? What do you think? Decent, grand. Uh, into into <laughs> the into the mixer, into the 1980s British mixer. Patch right. Oh my 70s. god. Oh, the attitude. The attitude. I can't believe it. Yeah. So I've, uh, what else? Uh, maybe you got uh, Victor Meldrew, the uh, f- famous Victor Meldrew character. Now, I wouldn't I wouldn't have these on the pedestal? These are probably a level uh, a level below. Uh, I'm trying to think, uh, even like little things last of the summer war, and if you're talking very kind of uh, British kind of nostalgic, I remember that Sunday evening, don't pull that face on. You, you, see, you talk about uh, shows being great today, wrapped up after a couple of seasons. Last of the Summer Wine has like four billion episodes. No, it did. No, that, that was a, uh, that, that was the exception, but that was typical Sunday night because a lot of the a lot of this stuff I don't remember being. Sat, this was kind of Sunday night, wasn't it, Jerry? Again, you'd remember a lot. Of is Last of the Summer Wine not shite? I wanna. Is it? Is it not? So are we not in danger here? Of, of no, I'm not, I'm not good stuff up. With... no, no, no. You were I'm doing not, so well, Kenny. No, no. I'm yeah. not holding up. I'm not holding last of the summer wine. <laughs> I'm just saying, in, in terms of uh, nostalgia, that kind of British uh, comedy, which sat, which sat really well of its time. 
last of the summer. I would have been a huge fan of that. But there's there's there's, there's plenty. There's just so much of that stuff around. I'm looking at a few of the bits uh, that are. There was one there with those three lads again. Oh, you're not used to me here, Jerry. I'm going to come for you. Do you remember the three lads in the hospital? <clears throat> they were permanently in hospital. They went around with robes on. One was very well spoken. He had a cigar. The other fellow was a little bit more kind of working class. But they were it's kind not- of in, in the hospital ward, happy. Uh, H-A-P-P. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know oh, yeah, okay. I am. Do you remember that? So yes. that, that kind of stuff, there was loads of that, <laughs> there was loads of that kind of stuff, which... And that was all, I, yeah, but it was rubbish. That, that's the <laughs> stuff, I think, that gives British comedy a bad name. Because ultimately, nothing happens. There's no good lines. There's no point to it. It doesn't teach you anything. You come away going, well, that was just like a... And, and by the way, like that 12 to 14 anything. million people are watching it. Yeah, comedy it doesn't, doesn't teach even, anything. It's not even funny, though. That's Only when I laugh is what it's called. No, that's different. That's different. Don't start making the argument, like, what does it teach you? The comedy, I mean... Comedy is very few. You can mention maybe yes, minister, yes, prime minister. What does only fools and horses kind of teach you? You know, what does I'm, party... I'm on the fence about only fools and horses as a as an all time great comedy show. I I kind of think um it. I'm not sure that I get it the way everybody else seems to get only fools and horses. Yeah, that's yes, yeah, fair enough. I uh, I really liked it. Obviously, over a long long period of time again doesn't help. You know what I mean? I don't know how how long I play, but I play for a huge amount of time. But there's a couple of standout. I mean, standout moments. Uh, only fills and horses, Jay. You know the 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 wine bar, uh, uh, Del Boy. There was the the skateboarding <laughs> skateboarding with Rodney when he rolled him into the under 15s uh, skateboarding competition won a free holiday Rodney had to pretend to be a 15 year old skilled boy on the on the holiday so even the, I know what you mean so even in those vast amount of episodes on the chandeliers the classic chandeliers as you know you probably replace you get your chandeliers what clean what twice a year twice a year <laughs> in the reception table. so even the amount of episodes only fills uh, I still make the point I can still still t- Two, three, four, bang, episodes, moments there, I think. Absolute classic comedy. Similar to where uh, uh, John Cleese, I'm going to go back to uh, Faulty Towers, when he's he's driving out, he's having a panic, he's having a gourmet night, I think, or something. He drives the car, he's trying to get the food back, he's in a bit of a tiz, and the car cuts out. So it's the final moments of the, the episode. He absolutely loses, it gets out of the car. He's, he's, having a con- he's having an argument with the car, he's, sh- <laughs> he's shouting and screaming at the car like it's, a <laughs> like it's a person. And then he disappears off screen, you can still hear them shouting and screaming so the camera's just literally on the car then he arrives back with a branch a leafy branch and starts like thra- <laughs> thrashing thrashing the car so, so he's in such a dominant state obviously not that funny how I explain it but <laughs> it's, 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 it's visually, visually a lot more funnier yeah so th- those things for me when, when you got those standout moments that for me that tells you oh, there was something kind of uh, there was something special going on and I mention, I'm going to mention another one Royal Family come on give me a bit Owen oh, I like I've, I guess I get I get Royal Family, and it's certainly more my thing than yeah. uh, Faulty Towers would be. I'll I'll give you that, and yeah. um, like I, it's 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 well written for a very simple concept. Let's say you're talking about uh, a change down uh, behind the sofa. Uh, you could probably use that uh, for the budget of the Royal Family uh, sometimes. So it's like uh, it's fantastic in the in the simplicity of it. Yeah, uh, I like it. Yeah, no, it's good. It's a good shout, Kenny, and that's almost kind of like a crossroads. Like when was the first episode of? The Royal Family. If I just uh, look it up here, the first episode of the Royal Family was in 1998. So that that is kind of like a turning point for me, where there is like I I, I personally think in all types of television, not just in Britain, not just in the United States, and not just in comedy, it has got better and better and better as time has gone by. I think turn of the century uh, sparked a golden era of television and comedy is not on an island here. I think comedy improved drastically as we got into the new century. And those sort of late 90s are the first signs of really witty, intelligent comedy, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak uh, too much about in terms of, say, American comedy, which would be the obvious one in terms of the comparison over the last maybe 10 to 15 years, because I haven't seen a huge amount of it. So I, I wouldn't make a mistake you made in giving a strong opinion on comedy I hadn't seen, uh, Owen, as you've done. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, uh, British comedy. We're on a few series at the moment. So that's the big thing now, isn't it? We are talking to people at the moment. The big thing is, like, what are you watching? 
that's the that's the kind of the that's the end of the conversation before you put the phone down. I wasn't. I don't know if you've noticed that yourself. So what are you watching? So everybody's kind of making recommendations in terms of it's basically series. That's a conversation for another day in terms of some of those big chunky uh, series which are out there at the moment, which are absolutely brilliant. But even in terms of the comedy, so say say simple comedy, you probably wouldn't have said the youngsters jumped on a an American comedy, Brooklyn ninety nine. Yeah, very kind of simple, very, very good. Yeah, I mean, I kind of shied away for a little bit. Then I jumped out, come on, let's have a look at it. Like 20, 20 minute episodes, bang, bang, straight in there, like machine gun. But, but very good, very kind of, very clever, I think. Like some of the dialogue and characters are, you kind of, kind of quite get into it. So even that, I mean, that's only the last kind of two or three weeks, three weeks now I've got into that. But generally the American comedy, even American comedy, I'd go back uh, different strokes when I was growing up. Uh, Roseanne. Uh, that's the American comedy I was watching. Alf, remember you would Alf, you wouldn't even remember Alf, like, like that little puppet who was done. So those American comedies, back, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good. But, but in terms, of last 10, 15 years, I couldn't make, I couldn't give you a strong argument because I probably, I haven't watched, I haven't watched too much of it. Uh, I'll, I mean, you could throw a few bit things back at me in terms of. Well, well the whole co- the whole conversation started last week, Kenny, because we were talking about the U.S. office. And Stephanie was making the point that uh, the U.S. office is just far superior to the original office. And that's where this whole thing started. So it's, it's a debate about whether or not the American style was the reason why it got to another level, which I think it kind of is. We were making the point that basically the, the office in the U.K. is set in a very dreary location and it's very dreary people who are going nowhere, um, whereas there's a lot more hope connected to the US office like which is which is a decent point to make but also I don't mind dreariness I, I think that there is something to be gained from dreariness and uh, a dark element of comedy for sure but that's where it all started Kenny just for context but where's the breakthrough where you, you rattle off what's the three or four American uh, sitcoms of the last that you think wow this took this took it to a, to a different level in terms of what America was producing well, the U.S. office is my favorite television show of all time. Yeah, like so, well, yeah. In, in, well, including about, everything, I'm, including yeah, everything. That's based on, yeah, they, they, they stole that. I'm talking about original. I'm talking about original oh, ideas. Oh, oh. Have you seen It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? No. See, like, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even sure. Like, it, does that go down as a great one, or is it, or is it just uh, kind of a, a bit of a more of a niche comedy? I, I, I don't know. Like, I would have thought it's quite highly rated. I would have thought that that is the representation of what more recent American comedy has been. Parks and Recreation, Brooklyn Nine Nine, as you've mentioned, Brooklyn Nine Nine is probably your uh, eight out of ten, seven point five out of ten American yeah. comedy at the moment. That that is your level, Kenny. Like that that is in, in fairness, in, in terms of things that you've seen, that is your level. There are a couple that kind of peak above that for sure, but that Curve is your level. enthusiasm. And Curb Your Enthusiasm, Curb. sorry. Curb Your Enthusiasm right now in terms of shows that are currently airing is the best comedy show on television at the moment. Have you seen, th- seen any Curb Your Enthusiasm, Kenny? No. Okay. Oh, you would love it. I, I think, I think I think you'd love it. I think you are going to identify quite strongly with the main character in Kirby Enthusiasm. <laughs> I, 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 I think you will. Don't leave it hanging. Don't leave it hanging, Jerry. Don't leave it hanging. I, I think you will. Um, He's a miserable so bastard. <laughs> <laughs> but very funny at the same time. It's, uh, you know, and, and like, like certain things in certain ways, you know? Like Does that travel? Do, you think that, do you think that American uh, comedy travels, though, as well, over this side as opposed to the opposite? Ah, yeah. Uh, oh, do you know what I mean? Oh, I suppose oh, really, the opposite. Is, is there a real appetite for that type of American comedy generally over in the uh, Ireland, UK, this part of the world? And obviously, you're obviously a very European fan of it. Well, I, I think that there certainly is in this direction. And I think that it kind of broadens beyond the point of Netflix. Like people, a lot of people will get their kicks from watching SNL skits or watching other people on YouTube uh, at the moment, uh, as opposed to whether or not British comedy is doing much over in the States. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, to be honest. I'm, as a consumer on this side of the Atlantic, I can definitely say that we, I would say that we lap it up a lot more than they lap up any of the, the British comedies for sure. Mm. Mm, yeah. Can I say I think Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live is uh, chronically overrated. I think uh, It's Always Sunny is grand. I think it's like, I would say closer to five and a half to six. I, I, I used I to think, think that, SNL is this kind of... I, I used to think It's Always Sunny was that and I gave it another chance actually during this particular lockdown and I must say it's uh, been sensational. But I do agree with you on Curb. I think uh, post US office, I think that is definitely the best comedy we've had on television. It's absolutely sublime. That, get on that, Kenny, and we will do another podcast with you once you started Curb Your Enthusiasm. 
Yeah, we we definitely we could do a we could do a binge watch of uh, of Curb with you. The OTB Culture Hall of Fame, sponsored by Now TV, stream award winning dramas such as Game of Thrones and Parks and Recreation. And stream your all time favorite sitcoms, including The Office, Faulty Towers, and Only Fools and Horses on Now TV or Pixar greats like Inside Out and Toy Story Four. Uh, watch whatever you're in the mood for on Now TV. Who are you putting in the OTB Culture Hall of Fame this week, Kenny? Oh, for God's sake! You have to pick only one. I've had to pick oh, only one of these. Yeah. I'd uh, buy a hair. I'd have to be uh, Faulty Towers by a hair. Who's your favourite character in Faulty Towers? You, you, you can't get away with. He annoys me a little bit. Uh, that's the good thing, John, John Cleese. Actually, character actually annoys me a little bit. He does frustrate me, but I think it's a he's a brilliant character. So I couldn't. I, I do like uh, the two actresses uh, how they play the roles. But like I said, he just he absolutely dominates uh, John Cleese. So yeah, it has to be him. Michael. Don, am I back? Yeah, you're back. You're you're there, Jerry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, an uh, incoming phone call there. Is there a, a single moment from the series that you? I mean, you've already already given us three. There's the uh, the Germans. There's the uh, <laughs> car being trashed. There's the rats. That oh, the isn't car. actually enough. the car being trashed. I I can I can one of the very few things uh, I can remember. And you know, you get into that like hysterics very occasionally watching comedy. Comedy, yeah, you can have a laugh and that's funny and whatever. But but literally get yourself into a bit of kind of hysterics. Not that when you're kind of choking, you're choking yourself a little bit. And I do I do remember. Uh, get myself into that state uh, at that in that particular episode. I don't know which one it is. Actually, I have the thing here. Look, I brought it. I dug Gour- it gourmet, I think it's called, isn't it? You were right. He's having oh, a gourmet. The, the, oh, the gourmet even is it? Yeah. And funny yeah. enough, th- this is me at uh, Faulty Towers. And I tell you what, there's something nice as well about it. You know when you, you handle your video as opposed to like a, a, a typical DVD? Do you agree with me, Jared, in terms of, you know, just like, it's just a bit more substantial. It's just... <laughs> You know, you do, you know, you, the weight, it's the weight of it, isn't it? It's, it's the weight of it. It's the, I don't know what, it, it just, it just feels that you've got something a bit more substantial in your hand rather than the classic DVD. And a fucking DVD, you're going to try and pop it out. Well, you're going to stick one finger to try and get them both <laughs> even. You've got to, all of that rubbish. Eventually it ends up getting tattered or scraped anyway, where these things in terms of durability stand the test of time, you feel as if you actually, that's what I've always kept. I kept a lot of these. I got rid of them a, lot, uh, a few years ago. I got a lot of uh, uh, videos, but I kept about 50, maybe 50 plus. And I, I don't think I'll ever get rid of them because obviously there's some of the, the ones that I, that I always wanted to keep. But this is, this is the Faulty Towers one. Oh, one more thing. Can you see on the Faulty Towers? Oh, and do you see the, uh, this was the, uh, the sign. The sign. So there's a story behind us. So Faulty is every episode. Uh, the last shot before they went into the, the episode would be off the sign, but it was always minus a couple of letters <laughs> every <laughs> every episode. So they made up a, a silly little word by by drop uh, by dropping letters out. But the, they, there's one there's an anagram of the of Faulty Towers which uses all of the letters in Faulty Towers, and you, you have to make two words of it, and it's a it's a proper anagram. So I'm going to set you that task of finding out what mm. it is. I won't. I won't tell you what it is because I might get into trouble because it's it's a little bit borderline, borderline <laughs> in terms of language. <laughs> but you're a you're a bright spark on figure out faulty terror. Get, uh, get your anagram. And get back to me on it. See how long uh, it takes it. We can do that on social afterwards. Uh, <laughs> right. So one of the questions we ask every week is: it underrated? Is it overrated? As a piece of um, a piece of art, you love this. So you, obviously you're going to tell us that it is. Um, it is. Is it underrated? Do we do we appreciate? There's a whole generation like Owen tut tutting at uh, Faulty Towers. Tutting. Going, oh. No, I'll cut on a bit. I'm going to cut on a bit of slack here because some of that slapstick, you're right, Owen, actually doesn't it doesn't work for me. Thank you. And there, and, and uh, Basil uh, John Cleese's character, and that, like you said, he, if you would describe that character to me, I'd be kind of oh, I, I don't want to watch that. It kind of it gets under my skin a little bit. 
you know, the type of character that he is, and he's mm-hmm. very extroverted in how he reacts. It's over the top and all the stupid walks, and there's plenty of that kind of slapstick going around. But there's something about it, just how he plays the role. I just think it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing. So I, w- I would stick with that faulty towers. I mean, there's some great stuff there, but I, I, I would, I would just put that just ever so slightly ahead of the, uh, ahead of the rest. So is it underrated or overrated? But it's not. Uh, it's it's not underrated by people who bloody think it's great. I mean, it's, it all depends it. on the opinion. Yeah. yeah, you can you make it argue. Nobody's right or wrong at all in terms of this is great that this is. No, that was think. strong. This yes, is how I watched it. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I say it. this is the effect it has on me. Yeah, we can have an argue about it, but that, that's it at the end of the day. I don't think, I think people people actually love this. I don't think there's, there's a lot of in between with Faulty Terrors. You don't, uh, there's not too many people I think, ah, yeah, take her or leave it, Faulty Terrors. Some like going, ah, oh, oh, rah, 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 rah. Others, oh, this is like the best. You should simultaneously both watch. Uh, you you watch Curb, Kenny and Owen. You watch In Sequence. Uh, I've seen I've seen a lot of it already. No, so now I want Don to watch. No, I I've want Don to watch. No, he's he's been his, now. He's got stubborn now. Look, Jared, don't leave it now. He's stubborn now. He's got it into his head. He doesn't like it, and he's not going to be shifted. So I'm going to change. Going to change tact. I'm going to say to Owen, Owen, get yourself a little bit of Roy, uh, Royce and Damp, uh, and Steptoe and Son. Have a look okay. at that, and come back to me. Let me know what you think of it. Rising Damp and right. Steptoe and Son, I've got a... I, I, I sense you're a bit open. I sense you're a little bit... He's a bit more open to that, Jared. There's no point in pounding him with the uh, faulty towers. Just I've, goes I've seen a lot of faulty towers already. I know, I know what the gag yeah, is. And I, that's exactly my point. Look, he's at I, it again. See, Jared, I can see the joke, you can see the you joke see. coming a mile away. Oh, look, it's, it's uh, Manuel. Let's, let's all laugh at Manuel. Uh, and uh, <laughs> on we go. You're not going to let that go. Oh, no, no. No, he, he, and... Uh, no, I respect it. No, I respect that, to be fair. For, I'm not going to browbeat you. Poor Andrew Sachs, uh, obviously the butt of many jokes, even into his 80s in uh, the real world too. Faulty Towers, available to stream on Now TV, is this week's entry into the OTB Culture Hall of Fame, sponsored by Now TV. Kenny Cunningham, you've been a gent. Uh, stay well, and uh, you don't actually need a DVD anymore or uh, an old video player. You can just get on Now TV and stream everything you want. Listen, one more thing. I want to say thanks to you because uh, Tommy bullied me out to the garage to get that uh, Faulty Towers uh, VHS video. And while I was, look what I stumbled across. Oh, brilliant. Oh, wow. oh I want to go over the cups of that. Classic. Look at the thickness of that. Look at the thickness. Look, look. That's what I'm talking about. H- have That's you heard about... Quality VHS. Uh, isn't there a, a spin-off coming this year? What? No Isn't there a, a spin-off? I won't be over to Cuckoo's Nest uh, spin-off. Oh, not interested. Yeah. Not come, interested. Come this, how, how are you not interested when you've got a VHS of the original movie in your hand? Surely you've got to be Jack, interested. Jack Nicholson. End yeah. off. End off. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. amazing performance. That's probably top five films of all time. That's obviously taking the argument in a different direction, but top five films of all time for me. Well, we'll come back. We'll come back to Kenny's top five films of all time at some other point in the future. But that's this week's OTB Culture Hall of Fame. Kenny Cunningham, thanks very much. Cheers, lads.